I grew up in my career with the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think over the last few years, that's really evolved for me. And I think it's not who you know anymore, but it's who knows you. We learnt a lot. I think we were pretty naive in the first few months and we just put our head down and, and did the work. The thing that's really helped me personally grow is if you always have to think, why would someone want to share this? Because they found value. You know, I'm sure we've all had those instances where you follow someone on social media and you're like, should I ask them about their trip to Italy in yeah, 2023? Yeah, yeah. I'm very blunt with my audience as you well are. and I think they like that, but I will shamelessly, I'll be like, guys, you've had 350 hours of free content, buy my fucking book, pay up. Authenticity is rewarded on social media mm. because so many people expect deception. Mm. So when people are authentic, they're like, oh, this person's sharing so much of their life. And it's like, that's how it should be. Our members, and it turns out they hate a humble brag. They are not into content that is sort of heroing individuals that are really just Powering themselves but not in an authentic way. It just feels a bit yucky. Running does suck. It does. But I think... Um, Alexis loves running. <laughs> I like running too. It all comes back to people just want to feel connected. Like people literally just want to feel like they... Welcome to Top of Mind. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. Of course. Thank you for being here. Now, I think before we start, I grew up in the, my career with the saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think over the last few years, that's really evolved for me. And I think it's not what you know, it's not who you know anymore, but it's who knows you. And I think that that's a really important place to start because um, this podcast is all about understanding how be the people can know you, like you, and trust you, and ultimately buy from you, right? Um, Josh, we're going to start with you. You started a Revel with four clubs initially, and you now have 30 locations. I'm going to go straight to the tactics because people want to know how you did it. What are the, th the key tactics that you've implemented to grow the business to 30 locations? Well, we <laughs> learnt a lot. We learnt a hell of a lot. I think we were pretty naive in the first uh, few months, actually the first couple of years, to be honest, um, and we just put our head down and, and did the work. But I think what really worked for us in the early days was we had some key people of influence uh, involved in the brand, uh, probably about five or six, and they were coaching at our locations, they were writing programs, etc. cetera. Um, and these guys really helped push our brand, I guess, out into the market, uh, fitness, I'm sure we all know is a very saturated market and if you're bringing a new brand into that space you need to be different you need to bring something special um, so I think aligning with some of those guys in the early days really helped uh, and then I guess the business grew uh, to a certain point where we needed it to be about more than just these individuals uh, and that's when we turned the focus on onto building the brand um, which has its own challenges as well, right? So, um, yeah, it's been a, a hard and fast four years, uh, but, yeah, happy to go from four to, to 30 and hopefully more. I mean, it's a pretty big, big achievement. Um, Alexis, I've known you from the days of when you were a Pilates instructor. I know, and we'd go to those events and that always put you at the front. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I was always like, why am I at the front? But Alexis would always find the humour in it. Um, <laughs> You've grown your brand from a Pilates instructor to a neuroscientist to a best-selling author to a podcast host, well, podcast host, then best-selling author. If anyone here is looking to start their personal brand, what advice do you have for them in where to start? So I think obviously it's really hard, like what you're talking about, a saturated market, the same goes for like podcasting and with social media, it is very saturated, but in the same breath, it's also, it's never been easier to reach an audience. So I think it's kind of, you're working against, you know, like you're working with something and against something and you've got to look at it as firstly, you want to be speaking to something that you could speak to for a very long time, something that's not going to fade away. It's not something in the moment. It's something that you're like, yeah, this is something I can really sink my teeth into. I do think that having something niche is important, but you can go a bit broader than that. Like my podcast, while it's about neuroscience and psychology, it's pretty broad. Like I talk about so many different topics. I think the thing that's really helped me personally grow is when I 
upload something, I always, especially if I'm looking at it from a growth perspective, you always have to think, why would someone want to share this? Like, it's not good enough to be like, this is me, oh my God, listen to my life, because people are going to be like, okay, that's great, but I'm not going to share this. I might be interested in looking, in, in general, unless you're the Kardashians, no one really cares. So if you've got something of value to give, you know, most of the things that people message me when they're talking about my podcast is like, I've got my sisters on, I've got my brother, my dad, my mom, oh my God, everyone, I've forced everyone to listen to it because they found value. So if you can provide something, and it doesn't have to be educational, it's, there's different pillars, there's education, there's humour, there's escapism, there's all these different value offerings that you can provide. And if it's something that's going to strike a chord with somebody, they will share it. Love it. I love it. Catherine, one of my favourite stats is content shared by employees generates eight times more engagement than if it was shared by the brand. If you love this episode, help us to grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving a review. As a resident LinkedIn expert here, why should business owners and leaders be encouraging their teams to be on LinkedIn and share their content? Yeah, I think, well, firstly, it is um, a hugely growing platform. It really is the place to establish yourself as a professional and a personal. We've seen huge amounts of change since COVID. We sort of had that intertwined moment where we weren't sure if we were working, living, living, working, whatever it was. And I think since then we've had huge amounts of engagement. So it's a hub. It's thriving at the moment. It's definitely the place to get involved in conversations that matter. And I think to Alexis's piece, it's like content that's grounded in authenticity. It shares knowledge. It might connect you to new people. It's absolutely the place to be doing that. And I think if you can sort of instill that within yourselves or um, your companies, your employees, whoever that may be, then you're just going to let them feel empowered and let them know that they have a safe space to talk about and sort of share their voice. And I think that is, you know, we're, we're kind of positioned as such like a unique offering in terms of the ecosystem of social media platforms. Um, but because of that, I think we can go really quite far with who we're reaching and who we're talking to. So I think start thinking about your brand DNA. What are your values? What does that look like to you? And then start thinking about how you can tell your employees that and then let them feel, like I said before, empowered and sort of be those employee advocates, you know, let them champion your journey and share your vision and mission. And I think, yeah, value. It's all about sharing value for sure. Absolutely. Now, Josh, we spoke about the fact that you have 30 locations, but each of those 30 locations aren't owned and operated by you or the HQ team. The one thing that I love about the Revel branding is the cohesiveness of it. You click on a, you know, a, a gym or, down, or a studio down in Melbourne, the content looks very similar to the student, that studio up in Sydney. Um, but how do you balance the content that you're providing as head office and allowing them to create a bit more of a brand and a personality within the individual respective studios as well? Yeah, I think for us, I think, uh, you know, all our locations essentially look to us for the next trend. Um, so we've essentially got to be the leader in our business for what's next. Um, we've got a few of our marketing girlies here tonight. Shout out. Um, shout out. Welcome. Um, but I think, I think what, what we see is when, when we kind of push the boundaries and when we create uh, exciting content, new content, um, that people engage with and, and it's essentially bringing value to, to our audience, then our studios grab onto it like that. Um, so it's just about, for us, it's always about pushing the boundaries. I think we kind of entered the market and we're very different to a lot of the other brands out there. We're a lot, you know, we're, we're not a commercial brand, an overly commercial brand. We kind of stick in our lane. We know what we're good at. We know what we're not. Um, so I think it's just about uh, conveying that the best way we can and constantly pushing the boundaries in the marketing sense. I love it. Now, Alexis, I went to Fred again last night. Sorry to anyone who missed out, but... I'm going tonight. Amazing. Um, I was talking to um, one of the main promoters there and he was talking about, you know, Fred again selling out overnight, Fisher selling 30,000 tickets in one day. And he no longer talks about them as artists. He's like, they're a brand. People aren't going just for their music anymore. They're going because they like their personality, like the content that's being produced on social media, et cetera. Now, you share, you know, your personal life, what goes on behind the scenes. You're going to get croissants in the morning. The things that don't sell or promote your podcast or your books or anything like that. But then you do use the platform to push your podcast and, 
you know, share the stories that you've got to tell and your books that you're launching. How do you balance the content between personal and, I suppose, business or, I suppose, sales-based content? Yeah, so for me, what was probably different than for a lot of people is that my Instagram following grew because of my podcast and it wasn't the other way around. I think a lot of people start off having a big um, Instagram and then launch a podcast off the back of that. Mine was the other way around. So most of the people that follow me on Instagram are podcast. They're my beans. I call them my beans. They're my beans. (laughs) And so I try to make sure that it's quite cohesive with what I talk about on the podcast. Not so much in the sense of, oh, I've got to represent my brand. But if I talk about things that I enjoy doing and my friends, I I talk about my partner and my friends on my podcast all the time. So I include them in my social media as well, obviously with their consent. But, you know, like I'm I'm, I'm bringing in my best friend Liv. She gets people that she, you know, she works in you know, sales and media and whatever, and she'll walk into offices and they're like, we already know you, we know you from Alexis's Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just like, oh, I'm famous by association. So but it's, yeah, it's, it's really funny. Or the other day I was having coffee with, with Liv and this girl walked past and then she kind of came back and she was like, oh my God, I, I thought it was you and then I wasn't sure and then I saw Liv and then I was like, it's definitely you. So oh people God. just, you know, they, they get like a slice of your life and I think they enjoy that. Obviously there's a lot of stuff that sometimes I'll be out doing something with my family and I'll think, oh, I just won't post. I just want to just have a night just to myself and nothing. You know, there'll be 24, 48 hours where nothing goes live and I know that's not ideal. You'll be the first to tell me that. But, <laughs> but yeah, so it's not everything that I'm posting but I think it's really nice when people meet you and they're like, I know you. I, I feel like I know you and then they get both angles of it. They get the storytelling and then they see the video on socials. I think it makes them feel like they've got this holistic connection to you. Yeah, well, there's a term, right, and I'm sure you'll be the first to correct me if I'm wrong, but this term that kind of developed over COVID, which is like parasocial relationships, where, you know, I will follow somebody and I feel as though they're my friend. Mm. And it's because they've shared a period of their life or a slice of, you know, what they do that's not their job or, you know, potentially the thing that they're selling. They're, you know, sharing where they're going or what they got up to on the weekend. And you feel like you get this glimpse and then you feel like you know them. Mm. And that's why you'll have people constantly coming up to you being like oh my gosh you know I'm sure we've all had those instances where you follow someone on social media and you're like should I ask them about their trip to Italy in 2023 (laughs) or not because it's like they don't know you so I think it's it's a really um valid point but I think how do you balance then if you've got a something that you're promoting Mm. and you're like okay well I need to tell them that my book's launching are you just really authentic with like how you share that in terms of announcing it yeah definitely and I will I'm, I mean, I'm very blunt with my audience as you well are. and I think they like that, but I will shamelessly, I'll be like, guys, you get, you've had 350 hours of free content, buy my fucking book, you know, like <laughs> you pay up, you know, and they, and they do. Like yeah. they're like, yeah, true, true, she's given us so much for free. Like I just will shamelessly talk about it in that way. I'll say, you know, I have no problem selling something that I've poured my heart and soul into. I don't think there's any shame in having a purpose but also making money from that purpose. You know, you don't shame a doctor for making money even though they're helping somebody. There's nothing wrong with that. So I think absolutely, you know, if it's something that you genuinely believe in, same with products that, you know, my podcast makes money because of advertising. So I have to do sponsored ads all the time. And there's a vetting process that goes through and I'm not going to be doing ads with companies that I don't align with at all. But at the end of the day, my audience is very well aware that they are accessing all this free content thanks to the sponsors. So I think if you make it really, really clear to your audience, they're so fine with it. I think it only gets weird if you try and make it like, this is authentic, without saying this is a sponsorship or I'm working with a brand or this brand is helping me do this. Um, When you word it that way, they're fully on board. you just got to be really transparent with it. And I think that's the biggest thing as well. I think authenticity is rewarded on social media Mm. because so many people expect deception. Mm. So when people are authentic, they're like, oh, this person's sharing so much of their life. And it's like, that's how it should be. Like, let's not forget Instagram started where you couldn't upload photos that you'd taken from your camera roll. It was instant. And for anyone who (laughs) wasn't here at the start of Instagram... Drama! um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think there is, um, oh. you know, the ability to just upload photos instantly was what Instagram started for. So I think that's a, a really interesting point. Now, Catherine, um, something that I hear all the time is um, people who are on LinkedIn are saying it's the new Facebook. 
people are seeing people's sunrise walks, you know, their inspirational stories and all of those things. What do the team at LinkedIn think about becoming the new Facebook? Um, professional line or personal opinion? Both. Um, no, so I think, you know, it is, as I mentioned before, it is such a growing platform. And so I can understand why people might liken some of the synergies in terms of the content that's shared. We did get some feedback um, <laughs> from our members and it turns out they hate a humble brag. They are not into content that is sort of heroing individuals that are really just powering themselves, but not in an authentic way. It just feels a bit yucky, uh, not the actual term for it, but it doesn't feel great. And so because of that, we made a lot of changes to the algorithm. Um, the platform now intuitively sort of promotes uh, content that is going to be more relevant to the audience that you're actually trying to go out to. So if you're a marketer, it's going to make sure it's actually seen by marketers. It's not just going to you know, promote you because you've been liked a lot. It's actually going to start thinking about, is this relevant to the right audience? And so I understand you, I, I hear you, we've made some changes. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you can't be authentic. I think there's absolutely no problem tying it back into who you are or what your brand DNA is. And I think when I speak about brand DNA, it's like my favorite thing, by the way. So this is basically who you are at your sort of core and think about it as like a Venn diagram. So it's who you are when you show up to your potential investors, who you are when you show up to your potential employees, future employees, and who you are when you show up to your customers. And at the center of that Venn diagram is your brand DNA. And you want that to feel authentic to you. So no, maybe don't show me what you had for breakfast, but if there is a cool podcast or an insight you can share, any content that's sort of enriched in knowledge or value is going to be, as I said, preferred by the platform in itself. And I think that's the kind of conversations that we really want to sort of champion on the platform. Not to say don't bring your whole self, absolutely do, but maybe just start thinking about the types of things that you want to share and what you want to be known for. Yeah. I think one of the things we talk about all the time with our clients is around, you know, at the end of the day, when you call someone that you're working with or a client or, you know, perhaps a partner that you're working with, you don't get on the phone and say, hey, these are the products and services I'm selling straight away. You'll be like, how was the football on the weekend? How are the kids? How are the wife? Like, you talk about all of these other things that have nothing to do with work before you talk about the services. So I think remembering also that you're not just your job title when you're turning up on those platforms. Well, well, that's it. And I think especially with LinkedIn, everyone just assumes it's like this B2B platform. They're like, I'm selling to a business. There are people in those businesses. You are not selling to the company. Like we're all individuals, we've got emotions, we're humans, we're enriched in like experiences. And so you've got to think about the people that you're talking to. So it's all about building trust. So any sort of content that communicates you as an individual will build trust with your audience, regardless of whether that's your employee of somewhere or your, your own personal brand. I think we've all got a personal brand, whether we like it or not. Um, but yeah, I think build trust first and then the rest will sort of follow. I love that. Josh, now we recorded a podcast last, last week. Yeah, last week before. Yes. Oh, they're all going into one. Um, we spoke about the rise of run clubs because I'm fascinated. We spoke about the fact that it is a textbook marketing rollout in terms of the virality and how, you know, they've just exploded. Um, I personally despise running and will only run I don't, I if... I don't blame you. Yeah, I, I will only run if I'm getting a parking fine. Yep. Um... I've been trying to get into running and I'm getting better at it. But what is it about run clubs that makes it so compelling? That's a great question. For a non-runner. Because running does suck. It does. But I think... um, Alexis loves running. (laughs) I like running too, but I know a lot of people hate it, right? Um, But I think it kind of ties into what we do at Revel, um, which which is kind of cool. And I think it all comes back to people just want to feel connected. Like, people literally just want to feel like they belong somewhere. Um, You know, I recently, fairly recently, took up cycling. The exact same thing happens over there that happens in our gyms, that happens with all these run clubs going on now. People just want to feel part of something, and I think that's what this cycling move... uh, Sorry, it's... This Josh running, loves his bike, by the way. <laughs> this running movement has done. And, and I think you're right. It, it, it's a fantastic case study. Like, it's gone absolutely viral. You know, we were seeing people run with Salomon water packs running 2K, you know, in October last year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it happens. But you know what? Like, that's great. Like, fantastic. Mm. You know, if that motivates you to get out and go running, fantastic. Mm. Go and do it. Um, I think for us at Revel, 
it's not a competition for us. We love it. We embrace it. I think we uh, Revel kind of builds the foundation for people to go and do more, whether that's go and run, go and swim, play with your kids, whatever it is. Um, so I think for us, it's all about facilitating that journey for the customer, uh, more so than going, oh shit, that's comp. Sorry, can we swear? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Do you know me? <laughs> No, but I don't know yeah. these guys. <laughs> That's fine. Um, My mum and dad are used to it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it, it's not looking at these, at these trends as, okay, that's competition. It's like, cool, how can we leverage that? How can we use that? Um, and I think we put up a post tonight uh, that was essentially our first iteration of facilitating this, this running movement and showcasing all the run clubs that we have around our 30 locations uh, around the world. And that's just the beginning. Hey guys, if you are listening on Spotify, do not forget to give us a five-star rating. It will help us to reach more people. Revel Run Club. I call it trauma bonding. You call it Run Club. That's fine. Same, same. Um, Alexis, now I'm obsessed with psychology. We spoke about it all the time. Um, I think to, when, when I look at you know our client base that we look after from a personal branding point of view, two of the biggest things that come up when it comes to creating content for their brand or their business or as an individual is they're terrified to hit the post button. And I'm convinced that there's a phobia name out there for hitting the post button. And secondly, they're really scared to be judged more so I think on LinkedIn than any other platform because it's a professional platform. Um, now professional to me means doing your job. It doesn't talk about your hair colour, what you wear to work, anything like that. That's another conversation for another day. But what is it from a neuro, like neurological point of view or a psychology point of view that there's this fear around hitting posts or creating content in, in a professional environment? I would also like to know, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it all stems, I think, look, oh, I could talk about this, I've got like 10 episodes on this, so <laughs> check it out. But it all kind of stems from, oh, look, ultimately that comes from not wanting to be judged. That's normal, that's completely normal. And this idea of not wanting to be judged, I think is actually probably worse than ever because we're on such a visible platform. Um, and of course, you could talk about it as being fear, even the people, people might be like, oh, I'm, I'm just lazy, I'm not scared of it, I'm lazy, but it's an avoidance at the end of the day. And we avoid anything that equals abandonment or rejection or anything like that. I think that's a very emotional response to something. The moment you're able to just acknowledge that you're feeling that way, there's actually something that goes on in the brain, it's really interesting. So any emotional response that you have happens in like your limbic system, which has your amygdala, which you've probably heard about. And that's like a, this like intense visceral reaction to something. And then you've got the prefrontal cortex, which is your reasoning, your executive function, all of that. And that's the part of the brain that, you know, helps you make, you know, informed decisions. The moment you, it's called name it to tame it, it's really cool. The moment you name a fear that you're experiencing instantly diminishes that fear just by naming it. So a lot of people will be denial, 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 and they're brushing it under the rug, brushing it under the rug, they get imposter syndrome, they panic, they don't ever, it's failure to launch. But instead, you should be like, wow, I'm really fucking scared of this rejection right now. Like, it's really happening. I'm really scared. Why am I scared? And then just by mentioning it, it doesn't make it worse. You actually think, oh, okay, I've, I'm now like shed light on the darkness and now it's stopped. It can't grow any further. And then you start to reason, 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 reason. And then you think, okay, am I going to die? No, I'm not. What's, what's the worst that can happen? Oh, it's actually fine. Oh, I'll just go ahead and do it. Because at the end of the day, what you have to acknowledge is people absolutely are going to laugh at you behind your back. There's no question about it. You know, especially if you're starting out. If you start doing something new, watch people laugh at you, watch them talk behind your back. But it's only at the start. Three months in, you know, once you change your reputation, once you level up to the next version of yourself, people forget. And then they're, they're all on board. <laughs> you know, like even people that like you will talk about you behind your back. Once you acknowledge that as just a fact, it's like, okay. I'm just going to get through that and then it's fine. You know, I'm sure that when I launch my podcast, some people are like, oh, good luck to her, you know. And I'm not even, like, that's fine because that's people's initial reaction. People don't like change. So if you can just acknowledge that that's human instinct to judge, then you don't look at it as such a personal attack. I love it. I think there's also that tall poppy syndrome, right? Like, yeah. In Australia, I've seen, you know, you speak to Americans, people in the UK, they're like, I'm so good at what I do and they're happy at putting themselves out there. You probably see it a lot on LinkedIn. Oh, <laughs> you are also British. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I think like in Australia, there's this tall poppy syndrome, right? Where, you know, people are waiting to be like, I told you it wouldn't work. 
And so I think there's that that acknowledgement of the fact that there will be people that talk about you regardless. So as long as it aligns with what you want to do and the values that you have, um, there's it's just that kind of barrier that you have to push through um, to get there. Now, Catherine, there's no hiding. I've spoken about it before. LinkedIn's my favourite platform and I'm not just saying that. Anyone who knows me or spends enough time with me knows that. Um, it's traditionally, and you spoke about it before, a B2B platform. For those of you that don't know what B2B means, that's business to business. Um, but I firmly believe that it can be a B2C platform as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how brands that are potentially talking to consumers that are purchasing their product, not businesses that are purchasing, the, purchasing their product, and how they could leverage LinkedIn as a platform? Yeah, well, I work with a lot of clients and... I'm going to say about 40% of them are probably B2C as well. So absolute proof in the pudding. They are there. They are doing it. I think there is that kind of fear of like, well, our content maybe isn't quite the right feel. You know, I don't know how to talk to somebody that's a business. But like I said before, there are people behind these businesses. So start talking about, you know, human connection points. What can you do in terms of your content that is B2C perhaps, but maybe give it a slightly different tone of voice. Like start thinking about what you want people to sort of feel or do or think or know after engaging with your content. And I think there absolutely is a platform for B2C. Yes, we are predominantly B2B and that is great because that's our speciality. But you guys are all consumers and I'm assuming, I'm hoping most of you in the room are also on LinkedIn. If not, sign up now. Um, but, you know, you are still going to be engaging with content when you're going through it. And I think the key is maybe not to think about it being B2C or B2B, but start thinking about the content that you're actually putting out there. So is it thumb stopping? Is it going to capture my attention? What am I going to learn from this? And I think it's that kind of fear piece, right? It's like as soon as you start and you can start small, even if it is a B2C brand, I think there's absolutely a place for it. Um, just be a part of the conversations that are going on there. Love it. Josh, last few questions um, before we wrap up. But when it comes to marketing, social media and personal branding, what are you guys specifically focusing on when it comes to growing the business for, from 30 studios up? Yeah, I think for us, um, so we are a franchise. Um, our strategy from this year onwards is to franchise a lot less. Um, I think what we've seen, especially in the Australian market, is that the consumer, the Aussie consumer, doesn't necessarily buy into franchises as much as they do boutique businesses. Um, and I am one of those. Um, so we're, we're essentially franchising a lot less this year. We're still franchising overseas and that sort of stuff, but it, it essentially gives us uh, a little bit of breathing room to step back and, and slow down on the growth side of things um, and just to focus on us uh, and build a solid brand. Uh, it's definitely something that has been watered down as we've grown and as we've expanded um, across the globe. So, uh, yeah, it's really just taking stock in, and we've just finished a, a big brand positioning piece towards the end of last year. Um, and we've, I've just presented that to the network over the last couple of weeks. Um, and the feedback coming back from that is we've never felt so connected to the brand. Um, so that's fantastic. It means we're kind of heading in the right direction. Um, so it's just about now executing on that, rolling that out. Uh, what does that look like across all our platforms, um, digital, print, et cetera? So for us, this year, it's all about just building brand for us. Including your personal brand, right? Including my personal brand. I'm super slack. Yeah. I'm super slack. <laughs> I've got the post thing. Uh, I'm, Get on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, sho I'm shocking at LinkedIn. <laughs> I'll just say, I'll just repost. And no, 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 no. Start small, start yes. small. You can repost. Okay. Just comment. your voice out there. Oh, comment. Yeah. That's all you need you to do. You guys are really motivating me. <laughs> oh, good, good. I need to hang around you two more often. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alexis, staying on that kind of psychology, uh, I suppose, path, uh, what happens to us and our brains when we're being sold to? Because I know immediately as soon as I see someone say, this is a sponsored ad, or... Oh, I'm working with this brand or whatever. There's an immediate part of me that goes, well, they're being paid to say that. So what is it from a psychological point of view and how can we kind of navigate that if we are working between sharing personal content and business-based con content? How can we kind of switch between acknowledging that your brain naturally will be like, you're being sold to? Um, and what can somebody that is sharing that content, uh, I suppose, do to potentially mitigate that or lessen it? Yeah, so I think it's really important to kind of look at different um, 
So for example, before I answer that question, the other day I went to the Huberman Lab live show. If anyone knows Obsessed, he's like an amazing neuroscientist podcaster. And he's got these long, 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 long term sponsorship deals. We're talking years, multiple year deals. One of them is with a company called Athletic Greens. And it's so, there's so much synergy between his brand and that brand that you never look at it as like, oh my God, I'm being spammed by Athletic Greens, even though he talks about it in every single episode as an ad. It's an ad at the start of his episode because you look at it as this is a partnership. So I think if you can, as a brand, think how can we actually partner with people, with influencers, with, with, with um, an opinion leader, how can we make it look like it's more of a partnership instead of like, hey guys, I'm promoting this product today and then nothing and then, hey, you know, because it's true. Initially, our initial reaction is oh, I'm kind of being sold to. Interestingly though, with podcasting, they found that there's two kinds of ads. One that's pre-recorded by the brand in a different voice and then there's a sponsored read where the host reads it. And because podcasting has such a strong trust with their audience because people aren't, it's not social media where we're watching someone for 30 seconds. You're listening to someone for 30 to an, 30 minutes to an hour. There's so much trust that the listening rate through a sponsored read where it's the podcaster is so much higher than through like an inserted ad from a brand. So I think that there is something to be said the more someone trusts somebody. And I think transparency. If you're completely transparent and say, hey, guys, you know, a lot of podcasters will say, please listen to my sponsors. They make this possible. So then instantly you, you hit their emotions and they think, oh, yeah, true. Like, I love this podcast, but you wouldn't be doing it if, it was, if, you, if you weren't getting paid. You know, you have to work. So I think there's a mix between absolute transparency, creating, if possible, if there's the budget, long-term partnerships with personalities. I think that makes all the difference. And before we go to Catherine, I have a question, more so a selfish question. Um, if you were to go back and start your personal brand again, Go back to Pilates instructor mm -hmm. Alexis. We met at these events that we were being forced to do crazy dance moves on, you know, exactly the, the jungle what it, the workout. Jungle and you were right at the front. You're like, how is this? How is I was this like, possible? how did we get here? Um, <laughs> if you were to go back and start your brand again, would there be something that you would do differently? Not in the starting of it, no. Um, because I think that. It was definitely quite clunky the way I did start it. The fitness thing, I had like 10,000 followers but no engagement whatsoever and it wasn't, I don't really even know how I got those 10,000 followers, probably from like some ass pics here and there. Like honestly, it was just like there was so no is that engagement. What I need to do? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you need to get your kid off. <laughs> and the, but the engagement was terrible. I'm talking like 60 <laughs> likes a photo with 10,000. It was just really bad, these, these followers. And, and it was 90% male 10% female, now it's 95% female, 5% male. So there's been a huge skew the other way. The podcast was what grew it. But I think there's certain things since I've started that I would do differently in the last four years. Like what? <laughs> leaving contracts, reading contracts better, oh, yes. um, leaving contracts earlier, knowing how to stand up for myself understanding my value moving forward, not just being like, oh my God, they're giving me a good deal and then signing my life away. I did, I made some big mistakes contractually with the podcast, which I'm out of now, thank God. But I think they're like huge learning curves and there's, if there's one lesson, read your contracts. But apart from that, I like how I started. I like that it was clunky. I liked that it was just a, like a hundred dollar microphone plugged into my seven year old laptop and that's how I started. I think it was a really, really good organic way of starting and I learned. I wouldn't have learnt the way I learnt if it was different. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I know, but I'm like, I kind of just want everyone <laughs> to share, right? Um, Catherine, two questions for you. What are br two things that brands or individuals, everyone here, if they're going back and they're like, okay, cool, fuck, I need to be on LinkedIn. What can they do either tonight when they get home or tomorrow to take that step in the right direction to be on LinkedIn and show up authentically on LinkedIn? I'd start thinking about your brand DNA. I really start thinking about, you know, who do you want to appear as? Who do you, and this is all things that you talk about as well, but it can be absolutely put onto the platform too. Who do you want to show up as? What do you want people to think, feel, do. Just have a note on your app, uh, on your app, on your phone, and just sort of start plugging in some keywords or thoughts and feelings. From there, you'll start to create more of a content strategy and you'll start to see, hey, these are my values. These are what I align with. And I think you can assess your values by understanding how you spend your time currently. 
that tends to be what your values are. And if that's not what you want them to be, reassess and learn, but then start thinking about, well, how can I create content around this? So is it as small as maybe you can share a post from somebody that you do admire and you know is on the platform? Is there an article that you could comment on? Is there somebody else that you know that you could just sort of give them a like? Just start your journey really small and build up to it. And then I think when you get some confidence, video. Video is where we are sort of seeing so much success at the moment. If you can capture audience attention and sort of gain that dwell time with them, your content is going to skyrocket. So if you're confident enough to do it, I have to say, I haven't done it yet. I just, I'm like, that's the worst thing ever. I'm like, do it, but I haven't. Um, so maybe tonight I should, maybe, maybe not after a few ones, but um, yeah, I think, you never know, you never know. Um, but I think, yeah, start really small and sort of build up to it. I think it's a confidence piece, right? I think we're all really happy to share that we've had a drink or whatever we're having on for breakfast on Instagram, but God forbid we a have a drink for breakfast. My drink for breakfast, and that's where I'm at. Um, <laughs> Good. No, but don't be afraid to show that you have a brain. You're all professionals in your own right. And like Hayley said, like professional is essentially, you've got skills to do your job. So don't be afraid to talk about that. So share something easy. You might have listened to something. Share something about tonight. There you go. Let's there do that. Go. That's super easy. So share something tonight, tag the relevant people and just, yeah, start small. But when you're ready, test the waters, diversify what you go out with, start thinking, I've done more than two, I'm well aware, I'm sorry, oh, but I'm excited fine. now. Keep going. Um, test the waters, diversify the assets, so test out a single image, does that work? Test out the video, it will work. Um, start thinking about different ways that you can show up organically, do polls, things that are gonna actually gonna engage your audience. And then when you're ready to sort of push that message out further, really start thinking about who you want to engage with your content. So start refining, you can do a lot of targeting on LinkedIn, it's like our bread and butter, we've got a wealth of first party data, which is essentially all uploaded by you guys, so you've done it yourselves. Um, and we can target based on, you know, is it a B2B campaign? Is it a B2C campaign? It doesn't matter, we've got so much profile data, so your, your message is 100%, well, that's a big stat. It's very likely to reach the intended audience and the right people, and from there you can grow, you can sort of engage more, and you can get a feel for what people actually like. Like Alexa said, not everyone's gonna like everything you do instantly, and that's so fine. Test and learn. And it comes back to consistency, right? I mean, I sound like a broken record and anyone that has come to a workshop of mine or works with me day in, day out, it's like one salad is not going to give you a six pack, right? In the same way that one post is not going to break the internet, in the same way that attending one gym class is not going to make you the fittest person on earth, right? So I think turning Unless up... Unless it's a rebel. Unless it's at Revel. You heard it here first. Don't make any brand promises you can't keep, Josh. True, um, true. Catherine, the last question I have for you is, where do people go wrong on LinkedIn? Like, what is one thing that you're like, oh, God, you shouldn't be doing that? Um, they just create this bizarre persona. Like, we've all seen it, right? You've gone onto LinkedIn or you've seen that content and it's like, I was on my way to an interview and I walked past a dog on the street and I patted it and then when I got to the interview, the dog was there and you're like, wow, that is bizarre. Um, and it's this like really strange way of telling stories. It doesn't align with them. Like you can see them in the street and you'd be like, why did you, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right. And it's that piece on authenticity again. So it's like, they don't quite know who they need to be in this professional space. I think we're all just trying to get comfortable, being a little uncomfortable with being professionals. Um, and I think, yeah, the one thing it's doing is just showing up in a way that's not authentic to you. The second worst thing, not showing up at all. So start posting. <laughs> there we go, there you go. You heard it first, not just from me. Um, I think you're so right. I mean, one of my biggest eye twitches is when I see people on LinkedIn saying, I'm pleased to announce I'm starting a new job. And I'm like, write it yourself. Like you've just got this amazing new job and you're using pre-curated content. Well, we do have AI now, which can actually exactly. write your posts for you Use and it. it can schedule them too. But you know, AI isn't you. You are what makes you uniquely yeah. you. And so, yeah, use so it to your... <laughs> use chat GPT, but review it, is what she's saying. Um, now, before we wrap up, I've got three questions that I end the podcast with um, every time. Josh knows them already because he's already done an episode with me, so no cheating. Um, we're going to do three questions, quick fire answer, single answer. What is one brand that first comes to mind for you, top of mind? Go. Me? Yep. Mm, good. Revel. You've learned. Sorry, no cheating. Okay. Canyon. Canyon, his bike, guys. <laughs> Red Bull. Red Bull, love. Canva. Canva. Would LinkedIn oh, be happy with that? Oh, LinkedIn. <laughs> Um, also Canva. Josh, still Canva. We love Canva. Um, what is one thing that you help, uh, what, that you think helps a business or a brand stay top of mind? 
I think consistency with your content. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm not good at that personally, but as a brand, we're pretty good at that, uh, and it's always a priority for us. So yeah, just staying consistent. Lexus, sticking to your overall like why or mm. like purpose. Yeah, love it. Um, tell stories consistently, but to the right people. Yeah, not everyone's going to be your audience. Um, and lastly, because I love quotes so much. Favourite quote that's top of mind that you want to leave people with tonight? Come on, Josh, let's get really deep. Uh, the one that I shared on the podcast that... It's, no, come on. No, you can use it, that's fine. <laughs> um, the one that I really love mm. is, is growth is not a cause, it's an outcome. Mm. Uh, and I think that, that really ties in with, I guess, our brand and, and business strategy this year. Yeah. Love it. Alexis, I know you have heaps. Oh, so many, but probably my favourite one is be who you are and say what you feel because those who matter don't mind and those who mind don't matter. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, we love Dr. Seuss. So cute. <laughs> Catherine? Face it till you ace it. Oh, love it. Yeah. Like That's it. a great one. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for sitting with me. Um, thank you all for being so patient and listening. Um, the podcast, as I said, is being launched um, and this will be one of the first episodes that goes up. Thank you so much for coming tonight. One last thing from me, if you enjoyed this episode, I would love if you could leave us a review or hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching this podcast. Thank you.